So Lydia Goldberg is a Brooklyn-based artist from North Carolina. She received her BFA from UNC Charlotte and MFA from SUNY Purchase. She has worked as the warehouse manager of a local fine art storage facility, the creating manager for a nationwide company and regular freelance art handler in New York City. Lydia has also worked alongside registrars of major collections and museums to workshop the packing and shipping of all types of art. She has enjoyed handling everything from Renaissance tapestries at St. John the Divine to Joan Jonas installations at the MoMA. Lydia currently works as the studio technician and manager for Ursula von Riedensbard and travels internationally to install her exhibitions. When not handling the work of others, she does many other great things. Just an introduction to what we'll be talking about. Um, I'm basically going to be kind of assuming that everybody here for the most part knows nothing, next to nothing, um, very little about uh, art handling in general. So as in the introduction you heard, I have worked in New York City as an art handler after finishing grad school. So, um, you know, like Zachary talked about in his presentation, working a full-time job while you try to do your own practice is very difficult, but I've found it to be really rewarding. I've really enjoyed um, the things that I've learned and I've found that art handling is really an art in itself. And I'm really happy to get to share some of the things that I've learned because I've recognized that in general, it seems like a lot of artists don't really have a big awareness um, about kind of the standards, um, best practices, uh, do's and don'ts, especially when it comes to how to actually ship your work in addition to how to pack it. So I'm just gonna share kind of the basics, um, nothing too complicated, some hardware that's handy, uh, as well as tips for shipping and if you're brave enough to FedEx your work. Um, so the first thing that I, in my own making, um, have really come to think about with a huge awareness that I never had since before I started working in our handling is uh, consider shipping while you're making. And of course, I don't mean that to affect what you're making exactly. We don't really want to make things specifically that are easy to ship. But if you're able to remain conscious, if you're making a super fragile sculpture that, um, you know, maybe it's a better idea to think about it in parts. How can I make this something that can be disassembled and put back together? Um, how can I make the especially fragile parts that are part of the sculpture um, easily removable so that those can be tended to in a very specific way? Um, think about making your sculptures modular. If you make a large painting, for instance, the one in um, the photo that I provided here, um, make sure that the stretchers break down. Um, that's something that I didn't realize was such a thing before I started art handling. And I think especially, I know a lot of people here are in the New York area, but especially in older cities, large objects it can be super problematic in a way that I um, had never anticipated. And it is no fun to be stuck in a stairwell with a painting that won't fit through the door or to show up with a large sculpture that won't, something won't fit in an elevator. Um, and you know, that's the responsibility of the company to do their due diligence to make sure that ingress and egress are easy. But I think we should also consider that as artists. So questions to ask while you work, can it leave my studio? Uh, that's something that I've actually kind of accidentally run into. You're in the throes of making, you're building something and then you realize it won't fit through the door. And then there's not necessarily an easy way to disassemble it to get it through the door. Um, that's a huge issue. And uh, hopefully we're thinking about that uh, beforehand. Can it fit through doors at all? Uh, can I make it easy to disassemble? Like I mentioned, fragile pieces detachable. Are certain parts more fragile than others? And how can we tend to those? Can a large painting be unstretched? Or is there a lot of texture that uh, we have to account for? And my dog is here, so pardon, pardon her <laughs> intrusion. Uh, this is Juno. But also in the picture, you can see that, uh, and also these are all my pictures. So um, in some of them, you'll notice that uh, there's a little bit of information redacted, just trying to keep people's information private, but just a lot of examples through the years that I have taken. But here you see, um, this is a pretty giant sculpture installation packed up for storage. 
So you can see it comes apart in many parts, um, and those can be addressed individually with special use of foam, hot glue gun, uh, foam core. Uh, it can make something pretty monumental way more manageable. Um, so also just considering what you are dealing with, what materials are you working with, what special needs are there with those materials? Um, do you need archival materials? Is it super sensitive to acids, uh, to oils, to moisture? Is something made of glass? You know, that's everybody's nightmare. Uh, glass is super hard to handle. Ceramic is kind of right up there with glass. Paper can be super temperamental for obvious reasons, really sensitive. Um, but even framed works, even once paper is framed, uh, you run into issues with how is it framed? Is it hinged? So if you don't know when you frame a drawing or a, a paper piece of any kind, sometimes it'll be hinged on all sides. So that means with the framer's tape, how they mount it within the frame. But a lot of times things will also just be hinged on the top. So if you were to turn the piece, there's a potential for the piece to fall, and that can be a very expensive reframing cost. And it could also damage the work. It could fold, um, it could dent. Also here you'll see in uh, this image on the left, bubble wrap uh, is not my favorite thing. For many things, it's perfectly fine, but you should really be careful. It should never be uh, touching, coming into contact with the piece. There should usually be, um, you know, glassine covering or uh, just a thin plastic sheeting covering. But bubble wrap, uh, you can see in the photo, will sometimes actually leave an imprint of the bubble wrap um, on a painting, usually. I've seen it interact with acrylics. So you have to be really careful uh, with certain materials, plastics off gas, and then they leave um, marks on different materials. So you want a barrier between those things. And I'll get to some materials that are good options for those. Uh, but then also on the right, you have an example. And this is kind of a um, geeky art handling. I, I have been really into these. Um, they just, it seems like a great idea to me. Uh, this is called a tip and tell. And these are things that get used for things that aren't supposed to tip. And this you kind of have to take uh, into account that these aren't often a way for you to point at someone and be like, you know, you did, you know, if you come to a shipper and say the tip and tell was tipped, it doesn't always do a lot of good. But what it can help is for you to identify like where something went wrong. If the tip and tell was fine when it was in one place and then it was triggered somewhere in between, you know that something happened. And that can be really helpful uh, when you open up a crate or even before you open the crate. You know, when I was working as a warehouse manager, the first thing you do when a crate shows up is you check for holes uh, and you see if there's a tip and tell what it looks like. And if it looks like this one, then you have a problem. Before you even open it, you contact who uh, owns the piece or who's in charge of the project that's uh, going on. Another thing to consider that happens a lot is uh, whether or not your piece is wet or tacky. This happens a ton and I never realized how many artists, I mean, it makes a lot of sense knowing, knowing us artists, but so many things uh, get shipped wet. And there are ways to deal with that. Uh, surprisingly, that may, that may come to, as a surprise to a lot of people. There are ways of working with that, but you've got to know that that is the case, uh, especially if you're working with an art handling crew that needs to be expressed first thing. Um, but you can also pack things yourself. There's some easy ways to deal with that. You know, if you are hiring a crew, make sure you tell them, make sure that you know that that might be an issue. Um, even tackiness can be a problem. So be aware of that. Um, be aware of brittle materials, be aware of temper temperature sensitive materials. There are, you know, certain products that can help keep things heat resistant. And then also I like to note that, you know, People make art out of all sorts of different things, but one thing that I've run into that becomes a major issue, especially with international shipping, is if you use any sort of animal products. That can be a big problem in customs, so keep that in mind if you know something is going to be having to go to another country because uh, there's certain things that have a lot of trouble crossing borders that I have known to be included in uh, artwork. At the beginning, um, thinking about also what happens when your piece gets to where it's going. Because a lot of times, I think especially in um, pandemic era, you are likely not going to be with your work when it gets to where it's going. Um, you may be entrusting an art handling company. You may be trusting the gallery. Uh, you may be trusting the collector, whoever they hire to perform this. That's usually the case. But 
on your end, you can do a lot to just make sure that people have what they need on the other side so that your work is cared for as safely as possible. So the first thing is even on your packaging, include images, uh, you know, just one image with the details about your work, like your typical name, size, fill that out with the medium, just so people know what they're dealing with. And also if you include a picture, they know what it's supposed to look like. I don't know how many times I've been uh, working in a warehouse where we've got to set things up for photography. You know, say an artist makes a new body of work and a gallery is coordinating the photography for them. But we get the work, we have no context for what it's supposed to be installed like. And if it's if it's abstract, then that's really hard to tell. And if they didn't also put installation hardware on the back, then it's really a toss up. Uh, so, you know, if you want to keep things safe, the less handling, the better. Try to do all your due, dil due diligence on your end. So label. Um, label the back of the work, sign your work. That's something, you know, I mean, that's a personal decision, but a lot of times we have people have to come back to sign the work if something gets sold. Provide instructions, provide instructions on how to open the box or the package, provide instructions on how to install. They can be with the piece in the package and also send a PDF. Sending as much as you can to eliminate any questions as far as how things should be handled is really the best way to go. Make your packing easy to reuse. I don't know if anyone is in the practice of making tape tabs, but an easy thing to do that's great for just being able to peel tape off of something and also get the tape off of your roll is to just fold it over and make a little tab. Never did that before in my life until I started doing art handling and it's such a lifesaver. So removable lids, um, you know, that way you don't have to pay to have a whole new set of uh, wrapping materials when something comes back to you. So also make sure that you have hardware already on your work. If people have to add a hardware, that's another added cost and more potential for somebody to damage your work. So the less handling, the better. Templates are great to provide so that any more complicated hardware installation is, is easy. So to do that, you could just hang a sheet of plastic on the wall, install your piece how you want it installed, and then you'll have an imprint of where screws should go. You can circle them with a Sharpie and make a leveling line. Uh, super simple. We do them at Ursula Studio all the time. Uh, it's a great way to really just streamline the process. In this image here, you can see that uh, we wrote like no knife, peel tape to open. That happens a lot because you're basically warning somebody, you know, don't go in here with your knife really quickly, which can happen. Um, the piece is probably very near the edge. So just providing instructions like that, if there's anything someone should be mindful of, is super helpful and, and the best thing for your work. Um, you can also see the arrows, face written on the front. Those are kind of the, the standard practices in um, the industry. And then just a pro tip, I tell this to people all the time, the way that your work is packed is setting a precedent for how it's going to be handled. And that's not to say that people are just going to, you know, treat your your artwork in a ridiculously different way if it is packed poorly but there's definitely a tone set for somebody who presents something in really clean packaging with their instructions everything is thought out and and cleanly well prepared that really makes a difference in how thoughtful you are about the work um, and here are just some examples that i have come across in my work so on the left you'll see uh, a label and Unfortunately, I couldn't find a picture of what is also directly to the right of that. So this artist had a really wonderful studio. That's something to also keep in mind. A lot of, you know, obviously we're all not artists who have a studio who can do a lot of this work for us. But, you know, in sharing this with everyone, I hope that you can maybe pick up some of the uh, good habits that they formed there. But um, in this occasion, they made a lot of the same size uh, flat work. And so they would order large amounts of travel frames and then each one would get two plastic sleeves. And on the left, you'd see an image of the work installed that was inside the crate with the information. And then on the right, it gave you handling instructions and exact installation instructions in plastic sleeves. So they didn't get damaged, crates get banged down around a lot. So the paper's not getting damaged. Um, and it, it specifically says, hang this 30 centimeters from the floor. Do not uh, touch the face, you will damage the print. Um, only handle on the sides where two 
pairs of nit or one pair of nitrile trial gloves and a pair of cotton gloves it just eliminates any questions because they know best and it's best for them to tell us exactly what they want. Um, so just something to think about as probably one of the best examples I've ever seen. And then on the right, just the simple thing of adding uh, D rings and or wire. Not everybody uses the wires, but adding that because I think a lot of folks think that if you have a 2D a painting a framed work. It's just kind of ready to go on a screw, and that's not how things get hung at uh, galleries or you know in people's homes. It's it's an unsafe way to hang things, and if you send something without any hardware, then you're inviting somebody with a screw gun to you know be at the back of your priceless object, which can be a bit dicey. Um, I've seen some bad things happen there. So if you could do that yourself. That's great. So just here's some more examples of clearly labeling things, um, putting notes that can give someone an idea of what they're dealing with. And just for context, these are within the like art handling industry context. So, you know, if you gave that box on the right to FedEx, nothing that you wrote there would matter. <laughs> They're gonna put stuff on top of it. They're probably gonna turn the box. Um, so that's something we'll talk about a little later. But um, if you do know that you're, you're you know, handing your, your package over to somebody who will take the special care, then these things are great notes just for people to have an idea of what they're dealing with. You know, ride flat if you have an object that is super sensitive with things on the surface that it's better for it to just rest with gravity. That's a great option. It's usually more expensive though because the footprint tends to be bigger sometimes. Nothing on top, you don't want something to crush, you know, and then on the right we have a neon where it was clearly stated on the face of the package. This is a neon, let it lay flat. And then you can also see a kind of interesting way that those get quickly packed with twist ties to the bottom of a box. So there's maybe an option if you have something, maybe not a neon, but something similar, you know, like a kind of a linear piece. Uh, there's an option, lay down foam, use twist ties. Uh, you can get really creative. So hopefully some of these examples will help if people have specific questions. Um, so here is just a list of materials. I'm kind of going to get start getting into specific packing methods, uh, different things that you can likely do at home. All of these materials you can order online. You will be getting an email with some resource links, but really you can, you can Google any of this stuff and it should come up uh, somewhere. You can source out the cheapest option, but yeah, you'll get a, an email with some links. Um, I've provided a master pack and then a PDF from the Met, which gives you some best practices for art handling. But here's just a list of some of the most important materials and some of the more specific things. Poly sheeting is just your typical plastic sheeting. Glassine, you are probably familiar with. It's anything from what you get at like a bakery, the little bag that you get a cookie in is glassine, but it's also something that's perfect for putting between drawings, between photos, prints, sometimes wrapping uh, an acrylic painting. Don't use it with oil, um, we'll get into that, but it's a great thing, great material to have, especially if you do a lot of drawings and prints. Double wall, tri-wall cardboard. So we're all familiar with regular cardboard, but there are also thicker options that are really handy for art packing. Double wall, in my experience, has been pretty much the standard for slip casing. That'll give you a really sturdy box. Um, but there's also tri-wall and that is like, it's almost, it's practically, I mean, it's not plywood obviously, but it is, super sturdy. You could build something very similar to a crate, uh, something super durable with that material. Foam core is kind of like a fancy version of cardboard, in my opinion. Uh, it looks really nice. It tends to be a bit sturdier. Glass skin is something that you attach to the face of framed work that's framed glazed with glass. Um, it won't keep the glass from breaking, but it will keep it, if it does break, it will keep it from falling into the piece. So if you're shipping something that's glazed with glass, heaven help you, but also use glass skin because if it breaks, if you don't use it, there's a potential for it to puncture the piece, but this at least will keep it from damaging the artwork. Bubble wrap, talk about that, everybody knows it. It has some dangers. Uh, microfoam is a great other option. Um, it's basically like a thin foam that is malleable. Uh, that's what we've used at my last position. Um, it's kind of my preference. Silicone release paper is super important if you're an oil painter in particular. It is a coated paper that sticks to virtually nothing. It actually needs a special tape to use it. They have silicone release paper tape. 
um, because regular tape won't stick to it. I have seen oil paintings rolled with glassine where when we unroll them, the glassine is completely stuck uh, because oil paint tends to remain tacky for long periods of time. So if you are using oil paints, I would say stick to the silicone release paper. It's a bit pricier, but you know, there's, it's hard to put a price on keeping things safe and keeping it a, a conservator is way more expensive, I guess, is the best way to put that. Dartec is a pretty sophisticated material. It's a super thin plastic material that's uh, temperature resistant, moisture resistant, also sticks to next to nothing. Um, it's pretty expensive. So I would only recommend this if you have something with a really high finish uh, that is really sensitive to scratching, really sensitive to to any interaction with other plastic materials. Sauna tubes are actually concrete forms, but they are crazy handy um, in the art handling field. Um, you can roll large works onto these. Um, you can get all different diameters. You know, it can go down to like, like a 10 inch, I think. Um, you could even get a mailing tube instead, which goes down to like two inches. You don't wanna roll something on a two inch tube, but they can be handy. Uh, but the sauna tubes are great, especially if you work with large paintings. Sometimes fiber artists, textile artists use them to roll large pieces. They're great. You can wrap Tyvek around them, something really soft, and then roll, put foam on the ends, box it. Um, you know, it's just a really versatile option for large works that can be rolled. Tyvek, like I mentioned, is a really wonderful soft material that is great to line crates, great to line sauna tubes, great to wrap sculptures with. Again, it's, um, it's not gonna really scratch anything. And then foam options, I actually have examples. This is Etha foam. It's actually great to have in a studio. Um, it's great to sit on the floor and sit flat works on, sit sculptures on. So if you ever see this, you know, I think in New York City, you might see it in kind of gallery zones and dumpsters because it tends to get thrown away after a certain point. Um, this is ester foam. This is uh, good for like carving out cavity packs. If you have really delicate, small, maybe ceramic work, you can stack this stuff and carve a hole into it so that something fits nicely in it. This is really shock absorb absorbing. Um, whereas this is shock absorbing, but not quite as much, but this is kind of the, the standard. And then Osclips and mending plates, uh, we'll talk about those. You can see those on the right here. Um, the mending plate is kind of the long rectangle. That is basically the cheap version of an Osclip. So you can do the same thing with a mending plate as you can with an Osclip. It's just, it's not quite as slick because you can't just hide it on the back of the painting. Um, so these are basically for essentially mounting a two-dimensional work inside of a crate or even possible to do it inside of a cardboard inside like a you could do a double wall cardboard or a triple wall cardboard put a hole through it and then mount your piece so that it's not touched on any sides so these get screwed into the back of the painting and then it gets put into it so it's basically you're like you're hanging the painting inside of the box um, and then it's good to be aware of archival materials. If you're willing to spend the extra money, these are great if you're also putting something into deep storage and you don't want um, you know, prolonged exposure to bubble wrap or something of that nature to end with uh, a changing of the, the nature of the work. So here's examples, um, slip case, really simple. Uh, anybody could do this. Uh, be careful with the knife. This is kind of the art handler standard, the Ulfa knife with, this is like a scoring part at the one end. So this basically with a slip case, you don't really want to cut the exact shape. You want to score the lines where you're going to fold, if that makes sense. So it's basically a box, but you know, a couple sides of your box are really thin. Um, so my tip for this is use a straight edge. If you want to have some really nice looking ones, like in this photo, uh, it takes a long time to get to a place where you can pull a straight edge with one of these. You can also use foam, bubble wrap, microfoam inside and then box around that. And these are a great way just to deal with two-dimensional works. You can also double slip case things for an extra layer of protection. Shadow box is one of my favorite things. These just always look really great um, and they are just really handy. I think I in particular, my work tends to have a lot of texture on the face and on the edges. Um, and so if you're if you're working like that, if you're making paintings or any sort of two-dimensional work um, or even sculptural work that is in this kind of two-dimensional 
format, just if you're worried about the face or the edges, this is a great way to go. If you're not worried about the edges, you can just pull up the sides right against the piece. Like you can see in this, this is actually called a floating shadow box where the piece is mounted on the inside, like I was previously talking about, and then um, nothing touches it basically, which is great. Um, that can be super helpful for pieces uh, that require it. But you can also just make one where the box is folded right up against the edge, but it just comes up a little higher. And then you can, put plastic over the top and you basically have a nice space above the work where nothing's messing with anything on the face. You're not gonna crush any texture, but it's super safe. And then you can also slip case this. So it doesn't have to stay like this. Plenty of things get shipped around New York this way. We just put cardboard in front of it on the truck and then you're ready to go. But if you are shipping something further and you're, you don't want it to be open like this, uh, then you can shadow or you can slip case the shadow box. Uh, it's a great thing to be able to do. This is also what you would do if something is wet. So you have a wet painting, it is possible to shadow box it and let it dry as you ship. It's kind of dangerous still, but it is possible. Um, so just, you know, if you're at a point of desperation where you're at the last moments of preparing for a show and your paint is still drying and the shipper's coming tomorrow, it could be okay. Uh, so it's good to keep that in mind and know that you have options. Um, this one's pretty simple. You're probably familiar with it, but uh, just a flat pack for portfolio for drawings, for photos, um, any just loose paper um, or paper-like objects. This can also be used with any fiber works, just pretty flat things can be put into some sort of portfolio. And then when you do these, it's great to use photo corners, which you see in the picture, and those secure it into the portfolio so things aren't sliding around. And that's basically just printer paper that you fold into a triangle, slide it onto the corners, and tape it down. And then when you need, are ready to remove it, make sure you put a tape tab, like I mentioned before, and then you just peel the tape up free one of the corners and everything can come out. This is another spot where you use glassing interleaving to protect the surfaces. Um, another tip, if you're using cardboard, you can reverse the direction of the ply of the cardboard. So if that makes sense, you know, in, on one side of the portfolio, portfolio, you're going vertical, on the other side, it goes horizontal. And I'm sure everyone's been in a situation where they've had a large sheet of cardboard and when you're carrying it in a way that the, the ply is going up and down, it just folds so easily. So to keep that from happening with your portfolio, you, you reverse them on either side. So that way one isn't just bending with the other. It's a good little tip. Uh, Sonotube, like I mentioned, um, these are some tapestries that were rolled. Uh, they've been wrapped in Tyvek afterwards. Um, and then the thing that I really love about this is that you can use this ether foam, um, make a square for both sides and essentially, essentially levitates the tube over the ground. So that way, your rolled piece never has to sit because of course you never want to sit the thing on the ground because then you'll end up with dents. Um, and then this is a great way that you can then box your piece. Um, if you had to ship a rolled tube, um, I wouldn't recommend shipping one this big in a box, but if you have a smaller one, you can put it into a box, put some filler around, bubble wrap, and then uh, send it on its way and you won't have to worry about it getting dented from sitting inside of something. Also, if you use collapsible stre stretchers, if this is a pain that has to get restretched, you can put the stretchers inside of the sono tube. Um, that's a good trick. And be careful with oil paintings. Use silicone release paper. I, I've had a, one horror story where a really prominent painter, I had to pull glassine it wasn't coming off of the painting. Uh, I had to stop because I just realized that I should not touch this any longer. And that was a long um, string of conservators coming and taking uh, things away, lots of pictures, bit of a nightmare. So silicone release paper for oil boxes for sculpture. This one I talked about previously. Uh, and then the one on the right is actually a glass piece. And this is something called a collar pack. If you have something that is super fragile, getting some ether foam and a glue gun, you can build a box and cut out spaces for these two pieces to meet. So essentially it's like a square cut in half. You cut out a notch for wherever your piece is going to be. And then you cut out another one for the second half. Hopefully that makes kind of a bit of sense as you look at the, the photo. But then when you close the face of the box, the box itself holds all those things together. So this is a super fragile glass piece um, of another prominent artist that 
uh, we did this collar pack with uh, this then got crated so you know if you are working with glass please get into the habit of, of getting crates maybe pick up pick it up on your own if you have access to a wood shop um, it's a great thing if you work with super fragile materials a lot can be done with just bubble wrap and tissue uh, in a box with sculptural works if you can take things apart um, just be mindful of how heavy certain pieces are in comparison to others. You know, you don't want to put something super heavy in a box, on, especially on top of objects that are more fragile. Clearly label what's in the box. If it's something glass, if it's neon, if it's, you know, even say how much is there. What parts are in this box? What parts are in that box? Keep things clear so that people know where things are supposed to go, what they should be expecting. And that helps things from getting lost because also things get lost a lot if things aren't stated clearly. That does happen, mistakes get made, but we don't lose things that are clearly put what they are, where they are. Uh, so again, labels, 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 um, and handles. Put handles on your box, especially if it's heavy. If you want to help make sure that someone is gonna handle something properly, put some handles on it. Um, I can't say that enough. It's like, if you are, doing this all day as an art handler, when you run into something that is super heavy and doesn't have any handles on it, sometimes even crates don't have handles on them. It just makes everything so much harder. And it's, it's, it's great when even a small box that has some weight to it has, you know, maybe just some little, even just some cardboard notches, you know, when you can cut like, like a banker's box that you put files in. Just even just doing a little something like that can really make a big difference. Um, and crating, I'm just gonna briefly touch on this because I'm assuming not a lot of people have this in their budget. I know like I don't personally, I can build my own crates, thank goodness, and working at Ursula's studio, I have access to a massive wood shop, but it is a great option, especially if you're considering using FedEx or UPS or, you know, postal service, God forbid, but, or especially if you're shipping internationally, uh, it's great to know what your options are. There are ways to do it cheaper um, and there are ways that can be really fancy. You know, if you can build a simple box yourself, that can be so helpful. One tip, always use plywood, especially, I mean, just always use plywood because you never know if your piece may end up needing to go international, but there's a big uh, hoop that you have to jump through where to use regular boards like pine boards, just non plywood, you would need to have a bug stamp because it's a way of regulating, you know, basically they don't want invasive species getting to other countries. So you have to have heat treated lumber. And the only way that they can track that is if you have this government issued stamp or you could just use plywood because plywood is automatically heat treated. So there's a note if you do do crating. There's fully enclosed crates, um, or you could do uh, something like a travel frame or a slat crate where you protect the work, but it's not a complete box. It doesn't have to be sophisticated. You have a little foam, even bubble wrap inside of a wooden box can be better than cardboard. And again, handles. But here you see two examples where we have the os clips on the left, which are hard to see, but uh, mending plates on the right. And again, these essentially do the same thing where you screw them into the back of the piece and then those get mounted into the crate. Um, and then in this example on the right, you can also see a, a great little handle that was added. This is a web scrapping, which is a great material, a cotton strapping, cotton webbing. Um, those are kind of all the different names for it. That stuff is really handy, especially for adding handles. It's just really thick material. Um, a lot of people use it for strapping on the trucks uh, to secure things to the side of the truck. But yes, crating, consider it, especially when you're using a courier, courier service like UPS, FedEx, and the like. So shipping, not a lot of pictures to go with the shipping, but um, a lot to talk about, obviously. Just real quick uh, image on the right. This is actually a made to order kind of customizable packing option for Flatworks that I think is great. Master Pack is the maker. It'll be a link sent to you. These are called uh, strong boxes and you basically pick a size that will fit your work and they come with foam inside that's perforated so that you can adjust it. And then it's like a really strong box that you then tape shut and it's, it's perfect for quick, a quick shipping option um, if you, aren't able to get all the materials that I uh, listed before. They don't come huge, but if you're working with a smaller piece, it's a great option. 
So insurance, this is usually a mystery to people, but also it's good to point out that if you are using an art handling company or even probably FedEx, I'm sure they have their own rates. Um, if you are not paying for extra insurance, it is only going to be covered at my last job. It was 50 cents a pound. So if anything happens to your work, even if it's their fault, it'll only be covered for 50 cents per pound. So that's probably pretty shocking, but that's on your, uh, when you sign a bill of lading, which is usually the paperwork that gets exchanged, that's in the legalese on the back usually. And that being said, usually nothing happens. For the most part, everything is safe, but it's a good thing to be aware of. And then if you do want to insure your work, there is, of course, a cost. I think at my last position, you claim the cost of the work, the value, and then on that value, you were charged eight cents a dollar. And that is the charge, the flat charge for the insurance. But then there are charges that go on top of that, which are condition reports. There's time and material that goes into condition reports. Those can be, if it's a simple one, it could only take an hour. If it's a complicated one, it could take two to three hours. If there's a lot wrong with the piece, a lot needs to be documented. A lot of photos need to be sent along. Condition reports can cost, you know, 150 to 200 dollars. So that's in addition to your insurance in some cases. So that's something to be aware of. Just make sure you know the terms of the insurance condition report at the beginning and the end. Just basically, the company is going to need to do what they need to do to make sure that they know the condition of the work when they got it and the condition of the work when it was dropped off. When is it safe to use FedEx or UPS? Big question. I tell people, if you're going to use it, assume that your box, your crate, whatever is going to get kicked around. It's going to get rolled. Um, we had a delivery once come from FedEx where it was a crate that had arrows pointing up and the FedEx guy, and he was a great guy. He was our usual guy that came like every other day. He rolled it end over end so that the arrows were just doing this right <laughs> so they don't listen to that so you need to take that into account that piece was fine but we have received pieces that were not fine from fedex even created ones um, a small framed work glazed with glass that was created sent via fedex was cracked uh, once so you really have to be careful uh, especially with glass but take the precautions i usually say my golden rule is nothing more that's more than two feet across and if it's something that can't turn then just don't bother but no more than two feet across and then double wrap it do the double slip case um, just do extra 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 packing um, it'll kind of increase the cost because you're increasing the size but it's worth it especially when dealing with uh, one of these career companies so international shipping and customs those are hard questions to answer i will be straight up it is really particular to the specific instance but my biggest advice or, you know, my one piece of advice, major advice for that is to get help from somebody who knows. Um, you really have to be an expert on this stuff. You do have options when you use couriers for them to be your shipping agent, like FedEx uh, will be your, your shipping agent if you need them to be, but you then still have to provide uh, copies of like a performa invoice, commercial invoice, uh, where basically you're stating what the thing is that you're shipping, your address and information, tax ID sometimes, just the contents, what it's made out of, and the value. Um, and then you have to provide like three to four copies because along the way, this person takes one, this person takes one, this person takes one. So there's a lot that goes into that. So please. Um, get some help, make sure that you do your due diligence because the last thing you want is for something to get stuck. Um, FedEx sometimes, I mean, I've heard horror stories about this, but things that come back to FedEx from customs that end up getting lost in the system, FedEx has an incinerator. So not to alarm anybody, I don't think it happens very often, but things that are abandoned at FedEx for long periods of time actually get incinerated, which I never knew, but that's um, something that happens. So you got to be careful, make sure, make sure things don't get stuck. Packing for the occasion, consider whether it's domestic or international, uh, kind of like what I've been saying with FedEx uh, versus an art carrier. Um, you know, if something's traveling just within the local New York area, 
you can use a lot less packing material, um, especially if you're using an art handling company. But if something's going California and it's going to be on a truck for two weeks, wrap it really safely. Uh, so consider how long it's going to be in transit. And then tips for saving money with art shippers, especially, I think the biggest thing is do your best not to require um, off route charges. So those are basically when Trucks are going back and forth across the country and they have offices that they stop at and they stop in major cities. If you require them to go away off of that, like beyond a certain amount of miles, um, that is when things get really expensive. So something to keep in mind, if you're able to drop something off at a warehouse rather than them come pick it up, if you're able to pack it yourself with all the tips that we've talked about here. If you're able to pick it up from a warehouse, basically if you can save them from sending a truck to you, that will save you some money. You know, it's hundreds of dollars per hour for art handlers, but if you can just drop something off at the company's warehouse, it's usually like 60 bucks for them to receive it. Uh, so that's a good tip as well. Also, if you're traveling from a residency, um, I've done this before ship with your friends, with your peers, if you're all going back to the same place. I know there's a lot of folks here in New York City. That's a great way to consolidate costs. You're going to pay less money if you do that. You know, same thing for other major cities. If that's not an option, it isn't an option, but sometimes it can really work. So if you can put all of your stuff together and send it as one, divide up the costs. That's a great way to um, just cut costs a little bit. And just in general, streamline the process. The less time and material a company has to spend, then uh, the less money that you're going to have to spend. And then two questions. Do you have any words of guidance or advice for artists who work full time apart from their practice? As I mentioned, I uh, have been doing this since I got out of grad school. It is a hard world out there, as uh, Zachary also talked about. I would just say that you have to have some discipline, which I know I really struggle with and a lot of people struggle with, but making a, a day, making a time that you hold yourself to, you know, say that Tuesdays and Wednesdays, Sundays, you know, Sundays and Mondays, whatever days that you tend to have a little more energy, you know, if it's just the weekends, so be it. Like, just decide on the time that you are going to spend on yourself. And then, you know, if you have a flexible position like I do, if there's not a whole lot going on at work and you have some possible time that you can take, you know, take those days and, and hold them for your, your, your practice, you know, not necessarily when you just want to go on a long weekend somewhere, but maybe a staycation where you just work on your art. And also if you can get a residency, like what Zachary was talking about, that is a great way to be able to spend some time and focus. If you can find a job that has some flexibility, that is really a blessing, I think. And next, do the features artists Featured artists struggle with too many ideas. Yes. Um, how do they manage to nurture all their potential while also handling administrative duties, et cetera? So kind of on a similar note as the last question, I do like to hold a day for admin duties or like an hour potentially, like maybe a, a couple days a week, you have an hour where you go through open calls or you work on, uh, you know, updating your artist statement. It's great to just hold that space and really try to hold yourself to that. And that's where it gets hard. Um, but as far as too many ideas, I have a little notebook. I also suffer from this plight, but I have a little notebook that I generally carry with me and I write things down. I do quick little sketches and I don't really hold myself to making myself do those. But if I'm ever feeling a block, if I'm ever feeling like I'm not sure what I should do. I have some time in my studio, but I, I'm just not sure where to go. It's a great little resource to have. And these things there, you forget about them very quickly. Um, you know, ideas kind of come and go, but if you have this little book that you can go through and you're like, oh yeah, wow, yeah, look at that. And then that might really get some juices flowing uh, in your studio. So that's kind of how I handle that. Um, hopefully that is helpful. And then a more pertinent question, how can I incorporate shipping costs into the price of my work? I guess my first kind of reaction to that is really what should be happening is that the person buying your work or the person, um, you know, I know this doesn't happen a lot with shows, they often make you pay to ship. Um, so maybe that is a specific instance that you're talking about. But if someone's buying your work, they should pay for the shipping. 
I mean, we all pay for shipping when we buy something online. Um, so that is something I think you can feel confident putting off the cost to the collector. Um, but if you are shipping to a gallery, it's easier to figure out what your shipping cost will be. So you can find where you're shipping it, get an estimate on how much that is going to cost. And I think it is appropriate to maybe adjust your price, um, given that you know gallery is taking a certain percentage if it sells, and then if it sells, you're going to have to spend this, um, you had to spend this amount of money to get it to the space. I think that's something that is probably done widely and is uh, an easy thing to do. So how can I get a stable job as a professional art handler? Uh, any job listings I've seen already require art handling experience. Um, this is tough and I have friends who have run into this. So I will tell you what I did. Um, I got out of grad school and I basically, I fluffed my resume. Um, I essentially said, I mean, and this is to some degree true, but you know, I really laid in heavy on what I knew how to do from being in art school. And I also helped a few friends pack their work for shows. And I, you know, I didn't say on my resume, hey, I helped a few friends pack shows. I cited them as artists. I said, which shows going to, um, you know, kind of referenced it in a more professional way. And I think I got a bit lucky. You know, I, I landed a job that was actually in Secaucus which was really hard living in Washington Heights. I drove to New Jersey every morning for work at 7 a.m. and uh, you know paid George Washington bridge tolls for a year and I couldn't do it anymore after a year. But that experience there was kind of my foot in the door. Um, I think maybe they were having a hard time hiring people in New Jersey, but I recommend maybe figuring out ways that you could fluff what you do know on your resume, um, a little bit of fake it till you make it, I think that can be super helpful. So let's see. Sample of the best you've ever seen is very informative. Please share a disaster anecdote of the worst you've ever seen. That's a great question. Um, I have seen, you know, as a kind of flip to best I've ever seen, I have seen art fairs end with things getting wrapped in trash bags. There's a little, uh, industry secret you know i think most art handlers know that that's what happens with art fairs but you know new york city is kind of the wild west of art handling and then especially so with art fairs so don't throw your painting in a trash bag um i'm sure it it doesn't make anybody here feel good to hear that like a gallery might do that <laughs> um but uh, that is definitely the worst thing I've ever seen. But as far as something that's not so blatantly wrong, I've seen instructions for a box written on the bottom of the box. So they had the arrows facing one way. And then on the opposite side of the box were instructions for opening a box. So obviously that doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Um, so that's another thing to just think about. Make sure things are clear in, in you know, whatever packing that you use. Can you talk about filing claims with shipping companies and some best practices to avoid denied claims? I guess I'm thinking that this might mean insurance claims. I mean, I've never really, uh, I've never had to deal with that on my own for my own work but I mean if someone's denied your claim I would I mean that almost sounds like you should maybe contact a lawyer if there was some damage done if I'm understanding the um, question correctly uh, if insurance was bought and and they deny it um, but maybe I don't know if you want to if maybe if there's an opportunity you can shoot me maybe a, a longer explanation of that question and I can try to help out a little more. As far as hanging hardware or hardware for hanging canvases, are eye screws a bad choice relative to D rings and the other picture? I'm not sure. I think maybe you're thinking yeah, like the little eyelet screws. Um, I mean, I guess it depends. I it's so this is kind of the hard thing about super specific questions via the internet but i think if i'm it depends on how how it's hanging because it's hard to visualize how if maybe maybe they're in on the top um i think that's fine it, that's kind of up to you as far as what the aesthetic is um you know if you want something to look seamless uh d-rings or a french cleat is actually my favorite thing um those are like two forty five degree angles where you hang one on the wall and one on your piece. Um, Google French cleat, if you don't know what it is, it's a really slick and super safe um, option. 
Uh, I think my preference is D-rings, but if, if the eyelet screws work for you um, for a very specific reason, I don't see why that would be an issue. But D-rings and a cleat are different, definitely the, um, oh, using screws to attach wire. I would use D-rings probably, but I think I have seen eye screws uh, used before, but D-rings are definitely more secure and you don't even have to use a wire with those. Um, have you ever used mushroom packaging? I don't think so. I'm not sure what that is. I want to say maybe it's some sort of recyclable material, um, but no, I haven't. Um, suggestions for shipping embossing print printmaking that are very fragile. Um, so I'm guessing, you know, if there's, uh, it's like embossed where the paper is 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 affected in that way. I think you could. There are ways to make boxes that push foam down onto corners, if that's possible. If there are areas of the piece that aren't that aren't embossed, you could also just use photo corners on the corners to secure it and then build a box around that. Um, you don't necessarily have to press it. Um, you could put foam around it. Just make sure that those edges, the corners, are all secured down potentially with photo corners. Um, I think that would be a good option. Yeah, we're out of time. Okay. <laughs> Um, I'll there try to get so many, so many more questions and th thank you for this talk. It was super specific and really great. Um, a lot of uh, a lot of conversation was happening in the chat as well. People get, sharing their own advices as yeah. you were talking. 